So on this week, um, the scripture and the message are inspired um, both by our conversation with um, Aaron Washington and Daniel Black that we commenced in pretty much all, all this week, um, but also by this family that we've been engaging the past few weeks in the book of Genesis. Uh, we've been looking at Jacob and Esau um, and their parents, Isaac and Rebecca, um, and some of the generational issues and trauma um, that they, they had to navigate through as we talked about love. Um, the last text that I preached two Sundays ago was about Jacob wrestling with the angel. And that happens to be the lectionary text for today. And so I'm going to read um, that scripture now and before our song of centering so that after it, we can flow right into this message. Y'all, we, 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 we going up a, a different side of the mountain on today. Is that all right? Um, and so um, all of y'all that enjoy a traditional church sermon, um, that's not what you're going to get today. Amen. Um, but there really is no such thing as a sermon having to fit in a box. You don't have to have a three-point sermon. You don't have to have a sermon that starts with, you know, a proposition and that builds a plot and does exegesis and ends with a celebration. Um, but homiletics or preaching um, can be creative. And so we are going to share a collective message with you on today as we engage forgiveness. And as you hear me reread these last two verses, I'm only going to read two verses in Genesis 32. Um, I want you to see Jacob, and I want you to see Esau, and I want you to see their family, and I want you to see yourself, and I want you to see us as a collective and as a communal we, um, because it is from us and to us um, that this message will speak to us on today. Amen. And so I'm going to read this text, and then I'm going to jump back to a wonderful song of censoring that we're going to hear from our dear sister, Venetia Marshall, and who y'all know can sing heaven down. Amen. Genesis 32, verses 30 and 31. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us all say thanks be to God. wrong way. Amen. Good afternoon, Rise family. As we are in our new season of forgiveness, we thank God for God's faithfulness in our forgiveness. As we forgive ourselves and grow in the capacity to forgive others, we can see how God is so faithful. And I personally just want to give thanks to God because on Tuesday I was at a red light uh, and just waited for the light to change and was hit from behind by a tow truck type tractor or a tractor tow type tow truck. And amazingly enough, I didn't have any damage to my vehicle and right now while I'm uh, working through some physical issues as a result of the impact. God's faithfulness met us right at the intersection of Floyd Road and Florence Drive. So I give thanks for God's faithfulness and I know that we've all seen it. It may not have been an accident. It may have been you just feeling depressed in the middle of the night and just trying to figure out what you were gonna do and getting that phone call or that unexpected check in the mail, or whatever and however God moved, we thank God for God's continued faithfulness every day.
You just don't know how sorry we are. That you had to wrestle with God and angels after wrestling with people all your life. It all leads to you wrestling with yourself. Can y'all hear me? Wave your hand. But as you do, we need to offer some correction. Hmm. You're limping because you chose to fight. But we know the fighting came out of a wounded spirit. We see you fighting at home and in the streets with your homies, your enemies, yourself, and with God. You love God, want to know God, want to understand God, but the church has left you with a limp and religion left you lame because you asked one question too many or you simply showed up as you are. We coming, y'all. <laughs> your limp is our limp. Your disability emerges out of collective strife. Yes, your failings produced hurt, but so did ours. You know, this black church organism was birthed as an invisible institution inside of that furnace of affliction called plantation. Ancestors went a many a nights down to the brush arbors, to the hush arbors, to connect with God and to try to make sense of what was happening to them. Why this great tribulation? Preachers telling them to obey things that brought hurt and abuse, but in the spiritual genius that they already had with them, while transported on slave ships, they turned the talking book into the good book by zooming in on the Exodus stories about enslaved folks set free with God on their side. God parted the Red Sea and led them on into freedom. By relating to this man named Jesus, Yeshua, who preached truth and liberation and who started an everlasting movement that connects the wayward back to God and creates disciples of love and justice. Hmm. Yes, that old time religion was good enough, but sadly we turned it into many other things. Are you listening church? We turned religion and church into an idol. And in the name of God, we policed bodies and spaces in ways that drove many away. We forgot that the scripture says that the letter we made women the backbone of the church, making them wear doilies on their heads and flowers on their chest, but never allowing them equity or space in the leadership of the very institution that rested on their shoulders. Y'all can tune me out when this is over. We sent them back into abusive relationships with folks who saw no conflict between the Bible and a good beating. We didn't teach them to run like Harriet ran and get out of there. And so we killed many and came back to church the next Sunday and we lifted our hands. This is the apology. We put folks on program and in positions and we clapped our hands while whispering in the pews, calling them sissies and dykes and punks and never truly seeing their God given worth or beauty, denying them leadership and ordination because we disagreed, but we didn't sit down to converse and get to know. And so we left folks fighting to show up authentically, but they ended up leaving with limps. Some stayed and limped in the sanctuary, beating themselves up as they limped along and others chose to limp outside of our doors and never to return. We silenced the young, except to hear them sing in the choir or the usher. We didn't actively develop them as leaders for right now, making room not only for their gifts, but for their respectful opinions. Amen, I said respectful young people. Many had prophetic insights birthed from the streets and broken homes and dysfunctional relationships, messages that would have made the church more humane and righteous if we had listened. Children forced to be quiet about molestation, about hunger and bullying, about loneliness and disconnection and hopelessness, about academic struggles and even their wrestlings with the Bible. We said the Lord's Prayer and we, we talked forgiveness, but we didn't live it didn't show you just how easy radical forgiveness can be. 
So you sought attention by holding on to stuff and holding things against people and over people's heads. We didn't teach you that the purpose of forgiveness is to set you free. We became one with capitalism and took on materialistic values that drove our church budgets and made people think that their offering was equivalent to them getting a blessing. We didn't call out hard enough the pastors of the 90s who aspired to find cars and mansions and who flew around in helicopters and jets, even here in the city of Atlanta, and then left many belief beneath the poverty line with a limp after being pimped. It left the younger generation feeling spoiled and entitled and needing entertainment church and, and, and embracing the get money ethic of the streets and in the church. God was not pleased. We didn't connect the often unnamed and unnumbered lynch to Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland in the church. So it took George Floyd in plain sight to wake many of us up, uh, to wake us up when the pulpit and the pew should have never ceased from troubling because the killing never ceased. All the while our children and youth continue to die at the hands of others and at their own hands, y'all, this is the apology. We left Martin and Malcolm and that movement for the street people and the politicians and forgot that it started in the church. Now we don't wanna hear a social justice and political, politically oriented sermon. We just wanna hear the Bible. But since when is it our liberation the good news? The reality the Bible points us to, the good news, is what Jesus did with his faith in his faith community. He called the community to accountability and de denounced the status quo. And so we apologize that we didn't choose to be the church and dismantle the very systems that make our conditions an ongoing reality. Or some did, and actually many did over time, but felt like they were largely alone because churches doing this work were so few and so far between. Can we talk about it? The rest just want to avoid God's lightning strike and make it to heaven. Getting there on their own and praying that you make it too. I hope you do. We are sorry that you don't know Jarena Lee and Amanda Berry Smith and Zilpha Elaw and Rebecca Cox Jackson, that you never heard about David Walker's appeal. We apologize that we didn't introduce you to James Cone's God of the Oppressed and to Katie's Cannon and to Dolores Williams' sisters in the wilderness, that we didn't quote black women in our sermons and read the Bible. Uh, we read the Bible solely like a man, that you didn't know before now that Frederick Douglass ha had a distinction between the Christianity of America and the Christianity of Christ, that Christianity is not the white man's religion and he never owned it, but thought he did and used it to enforce ownership of other human beings and his many other debaucheries. But we let the lie rule our interpretations of the Bible and ourselves. We let people leave the sanctuaries feeling guilty and beat up, but glad about it, mingled with feeling set free because Jesus died for them, but they, they still wrestled with, with feelings like they were less than because sin and what they did wrong was in every sermon we preached and they couldn't show up in the world knowing that black is king and king is Jesus and Jesus is black. We let go of the truth that this faith was birthed, birthed on African shores in the motherland where civilization cradled Jesus and African Jews. It was always a syncretistic faith that blended traditional rituals and African ways of being. We see it in Pentecostalism, but we deny it. Many do and won't admit that their songs and their shouts are continuations and not revelations. This is so much, and we ask your forgiveness for our failings. But I also hear our ancestor, Reverend Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, who always liked to say, don't throw out the baby with the bath water. You are still called to do the work that your soul must have. And you may have to do it with a limp. The church is still the place that the gates of hell won't prevail against. And we are better for it. It's still the place that calls this nation and this world to accountability and consciousness, to wake up and to connect back to God. The place where we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but we can respectfully still correct it, 
Coronavirus has called us out of buildings, out of temples, out of synagogues, out of mosques, out of elays, to do the work that our souls must have. Calling Christians to be the church, not just in word, but in deeds that truly set the captives free to do the work of healing the limbs. To call out the Isaacs and the Rebeccas for toxic marriages and relationships that left children with limps and wounds that, that, that then they afflicted upon their children, creating generations of trauma. Uh, this call to teach people that God is love and justice, to teach our people that they are worthy, to teach this generation that the gospel is still relevant, church music is still healing, the congregational community is still necessary for our thriving, even with our failings, God is still on the throne and yet saving preach that no church is perfect and will not cater to your every wish and desire nor should they and if it was perfect it stops being perfect the second we show up <laughs> that god is not seeking perfection anyway but completion and wholeness and our spiritual wounds can be healed as we rise and forgive others and ourselves and yes even as we forgive god and in the press for maturity, know that sometimes God heals wounds. In the press for maturity, know sometimes God heals by wounding. Mm. By breaking the bowed leg so it can be reset. By leaving us with a limp as we wrestle and hobble towards seeking healing where our individual and collective failings have produced hurt. Because sometimes, Jacob, what feels like God wounding us is actually God healing us, even if through the apology. Ashe. 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 So good, so good, so good. I so say. Good. Thank you for the apology. Part two, the apology. For everyone 40 years old or younger, it's hard for an elder to sacrifice so much, to work so hard, only to realize so many things. But it's true, we missed so many things. And some of the things we missed would have made a difference in the quality of your lives, I believe. Well, we've come today to tell you those things and to help you connect dots that might otherwise seem to have no connection. First, we did a horrible job of sharing our hearts with you, mm -hmm. our feelings, our thoughts, our desires, our fears. What we knew was how to survive. We didn't know that we were supposed to tell you when we cried or when we feared for your life or when we worried that we wouldn't have enough food to feed you. We thought that all we were supposed to do was be strength and courage and resolve. But we see now that that taught you not to care what we thought. We wanted you to become adults who knew how to work and care for others, but we never showed you that. All we showed you was how to hustle, and now that's what we have, a community of hustle and grind. We also should have touched you and held you and loved you just because you were ours, but we were afraid of touch. The only time we'd been touched was when we were whipped, so we didn't know how to touch and love. We didn't know we could touch and love. So we avoided you. We gave you instructions without adoration, information without knowledge, direction without vision. We should have rubbed your heads lovingly and held your hands because they were our hands. We should have kissed you even when you were grown. That would have endeared your hearts to us. That would have made you want to please us 
made you believe that nothing, nothing in the world was more satisfying than your elders' applause. But without touching you, we taught you the art of distance, the safety of aloofness, the deception of detachment. But we were wrong. There is nothing healing about isolation. There's nothing healing about insecurity, trying to make our way in the world by doing nothing but grinding, made us grind ourselves into nothing. In hindsight, we made one other mistake too. We saved you from too much. We didn't want you to struggle the way we had. So we overworked ourselves to assure that you had every opportunity we had dreamed of. It was a noble effort, I tell you but it did not work. It was a mistake. The more you give a child, the less they want. The more you save them from heartache and difficulty, the more they squander your sacrifices. We looked up one day expecting your generation to have all the degrees in the land, to own property across the nation, to have families filled with joy, and many of you have this indeed, but far too many don't. And it's because instead of teaching you discipline, we broke our necks to give you free opportunities. But anytime you give a person an opportunity, it means more to you than to them. Opportunity should be earned. Lord have mercy. We just didn't know this then. But we meant well. Can you see that? We meant well. Our hearts hoped for your success so desperately that we tried to give you a life where you could not fail. That alone is perfect failure. A child must have the opportunity to fail in order to choose success. You cannot give another person victory. You cannot guarantee someone else's success. You cannot manipulate the universe into promising a child's triumph. This is why in the 60s so much progress was made. Because most of us started with so little. We had a yearning, y'all, a burning in our hearts for something better, something more than one pair of shoes or one church outfit. We didn't know then that that was the fuel of our striving. We were ashamed of our struggle. So we promised ourselves that our children wouldn't do it. And most of you don't. But most of you also didn't take advantage of the opportunities we provided. Yet truth is, you couldn't because we gave it to you. We were also too great in our contradictions. We smoked too much while we prayed you wouldn't. We drank our troubles away, but troubles are good swimmers. So we guzzled before you and implanted vices of coping mechanisms that have come to destroy us. A child follows an example long before they follow wisdom. And much of our example was unhealthy. Sometimes we left you with grandparents simply because you were more than we had bargained for. This was immature to say the least. We planted in many of you seeds of abandonment, although we were always present. We were there, yes, but you didn't have our hearts. We were home at night, yes, but you never knew what we were thinking. Little did we know that we were raising you to want everything except us. Now, so many of you are unsure of yourselves, your strength, your purpose, your direction. And it's because we said one thing from our mouths and dismantled every piece of it in our action. Each of you is beautiful and talented and genius. We saw it in your eyes when you arrived, but we thought it more 
We thought it more than we said it, but I'm going to say it now. You are the hope of a desperate people. You are the ones we bargained for. Yes, in you, in you, you are the ones we cried and begged heaven for. In so many ways we failed you. That is the gospel truth. But we also did this hoping, hoping that meanness and evil in the world would not touch you. And now we need you. We need new images of ourselves, dear artists, pictures that make us smile back at ourselves and long to love each other. We need new stories, mighty writers, that tell the truth that we dreamed you long before you came. We need new songs, great musicians, that remind us of our power and our majesty and our courage to avoid all things ugly. We need new dances, you magical choreographers, dances that make us move freely like the rivers we cross from slavery to freedom, dances that swirl like unashamed leaves on a tree, dances that celebrate black bodies without selling them cheaply. We need poems, prophetic prophets, that put our verse, our triumphs and achievements, our dark hours and our afflictions into melody. I suppose in hindsight, every generation will have to do this if we are to prosper. So I've come today to say simply, very simply, forgive us. We fell short in many ways, but we stood tall too. We loved you and prayed for you and hoped for you and died for you and worked for you and struggled for you and argued for you and believed in you and this will have to be enough for your journey. It is enough. It's more than most of us ever had. That's why we know it is enough. Tomorrow will not promise you anything, youngster, except that you have a chance to do a new thing. Well, you are new, you're a new people. Come with a new thing. Do not spend your life sweating like we did alone and forget to touch, forget to hold, forget to love. For the gift we gave you is the clarity that grinding by itself only works when you stop and enjoy the harvest. Finally, do not honor Harry. Run. Do not praise Coltrane or play an instrument. Do not cheer Walt Chamberlain along unless you are prepared to square up with him on the court. Do not bow before Thurgood Marshall until your law school application has been submitted. Do not Preach. blast Aretha until you reach the same notes that he has written. This is how we work together for the most achieved Black community. We have expectations that you will exceed us. That is the natural order of things. But never forget that your success rests upon the backs of those who begged for your coming. We should have told you this. We should have admitted to you that we loved you desperately. Well, we will say it now. You should have heard us sing your praises and tell others of your awesomeness. Well, hear the song now. And if you did not ever hear it, hear it now. And once you hear it, get up and dance a perfect dance. Ashe. Oh Ashe. my God, Papa, that is Ashe. awesome. Ashe. 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 Everybody under 40 needs to hear that again and again and again. Wow. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And the older yes, people also. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, mother. Yes, ma'am. Aaron, you up? Part three, the apology and offering to build. It charge. Listen. To keep. This letter is a call, an urge, a poke, 
a reckoning for us as black folk to look within our very souls to search to see ourselves, the real, the deep work to believe that we are the ones we've been looking for, a collective reminder to believe in the abundance in our very presence here, a work that centers our ability to see beyond what our eyes can see, a work that will require making new space. I lean on the wisdom of our ancestors. You can't put new wine into old wine skins, the gospels. Our sister Tony K. Bombard told us, a people entrapped in another people's fiction is an endangered people. Who? Our ancestor, Sister Barbara Ann Tear told us, we are beautiful, imaginative, and gifted people, and we owe it to ourselves and to our future generations to restore, to recreate this beauty. We must begin building cultural centers where we can enjoy being free, open, and Black, where we can find out how talented we really are where we can be what we were born to be and not what we were brainwashed to be. And as my beloved friend and sister Sol Obama says, be still brave. The questions, what stops you from building? From making the thought that is lodged in the guts of you, from gathering the group your instinct led you to, what stops you from building? Is it your thought that you don't have enough knowledge? Is it your thought that you don't have the proper tools? Is it your thought that later on when you have what you need, you will do it? What stops you from building? Take that in. Is it your thought that I need to be stable to do it? <laughs> is it your thought that someone else is better suited to do the work? Is it your thought that someone one day will do it and then you will participate? What if the call you received inside to build what spirit has been telling you to build is not just your call, but our call? Rewind, rewind. What if the call you received inside to build what spirit has been telling you to build is not just your call, but our call? What if you not listening to your own thoughts stops us from hearing our call? What stops you from building? and offering. I offer these questions as a moment of humility to tell you I asked and still ask them today. In 2014, <clears throat> I was sitting in a PhD class in Minnesota listening to a white professor speak about the making of space. A student mentioned that blackness was never to be centered. As a minority, blackness was on the margin. I had never heard of margin in relation to blackness as I was raised in a black city, Montgomery, Alabama. I received my call. I started to doodle circles and I wrote the word soul in the center of them. The word soul center came to me. I had no idea what it meant, but it came to me. I ignored it for three years, y'all. I ignored my call for three years. If insanity is what we do, when we do something over and over again and expect a different result, then not doing something for years must be grief. What stops you from building? I ignored it because the possibility it offered to me was greater than where I felt I was. I ignored it because it was easy to build in someone else's institution versus building my own. It is easier to critique and analyze the buildings of others if you are not building. I ignored it because to consider it would make me, for one of the first times, see the genius of God, of the universe, of my ancestors, this divine assemblage, community of spirits and people literally here to help me make this very idea. We hear calls, but we don't really hear them sometimes. Fast forward to 2020. Soul Center is now officially open one month shy of a full year. We got a space. We offer Black youth the opportunity to build discipline and perspective. We devise shows that help us innovate the future we want to see. We are working on building methodologies of what it actually means to build space for Black youth in the digital. 
We do community mental health conversations. We offer monthly space to our queer and trans youth to write as a collective. We received grants and community donations in our first year, totaling almost $20,000. We just first filmed our first music video with an amazing healing that is coming to you from my very own brother, Ekio, his first music video. We mentor young folks to take our place. Let me say that again. We mentor young folks to take our place. The point I wanna make from this is not self-praise. It is a community praise. It is ancestral praise. It is our family's praise. I, we ancestors heard a call. I want you to see what my fear produced. <laughs> hearing a call to me, hearing a call to me is when we acknowledge that we can't do it by ourselves, that we trust the community assembled around us to make the thing we want to make. It requires vulnerability to tell the truth. As millennials, we are young and fly. We work for corporate spaces and huge institutions and create our own spaces. My apology from my generation is that we do not always tell the truth about what it is to build. We live in the facade of it. We hide behind the building while not exposing the pain, the insecurity, the risk, the financial risks, the oppression from within that are lodged in and what we say is being independent, cool, young and fly. It requires discipline and vulnerability to tell the truth about oneself, especially one that reveals. I pray that our generation hears these calls and that we don't have an issue reaching out to the folks that love us and ask for help. I pray that our generation doesn't use the supposed power of being independent and having institutions to then reinscribe the same violences of oppression against our own folks due to a lack of education, orientation, class, skin tone, finances, or religious practices. I pray that our generation will literally nurture the generation after us to take these spaces we've made to new levels. Nothing that comes to us individually is ours. It is my hope, my call to you millennials. You have to make spaces, material and digital, that young black folk can walk into with their heads up with the feeling of belonging and excitement of the possibility of being propelled to new levels. We have to, it's our call, it's our work. We have to believe that even when we don't have the tools, even when we do doubt ourselves, even with our insecurities and with every single limp, we have to build. We have to build through the pain of not thinking we are enough. We have to build through the pain of people telling us we not, are not enough. And sometimes y'all, sometimes we literally have to pretend we believe in what we are building. Whatever you gotta do, do it. But ah, the rub, hmm, the complication, the real, the moment that we feel we have to hold on to what we made, the moment that we claim that it is ours, the moment that <clears throat> we hold others to a lesser view because we have this power of creating, when we see ourselves in the same position for years upon years with no mentee in sight, before that, we need to train the youth to literally take our place. And in taking our place, they are taking their rightful place. It was our gift to them all along. Then my millennial brothers and sisters, you can go make something else and repeat it again and again and again. Our ancestors built churches in schools when we were forced to come to America. Black farmers plant seeds into the ground that provide food for their communities for a season. My parents, Michael and Sandra Washington, create space at their home with good food and good music to welcome black folk in their community. 
My sister and brother both built their own companies and divested from said institution. My grandmother, Bertie Lee Washington, made clothes for the community and sold them in her store that was right next door to her home. Booker T. Washington created Tuskegee Institute as a space to house the beauty of Black youth. And not only that, he sent vans into the community to then teach the youth's families because he didn't want education to be a barrier to their connection. Mary McLeod Bethune sold pies to raise money to build Bethune Cookman. All this world first building was called Faith Hall and it sat on the top of a city dump. Woo! In Dugo and Zinga, founded by Dr. Black holds its community accountable to be able to build since 1993. In Rise Church, innovated by the wonderful and skilled Omi K, literally is holding space now for this righteous reimagining of what it means to be in the church. Blessings to all of you. I speak life over what you are holding close to you. It is time to let it go. It is time to let it go. We are ready to receive our call. Thank you for my family being here. Blessings. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Ashe, 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 Ashe. Ashe. Ashe, oh. Oh Ashe. my God! Y'all can say yes. That you can perform it. The three of you, institution builders, you are each institution builders. I affirm you. Thank you. Thank you. Say that was special. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Next chapter, 33. Now Jacob, who was the trickster, looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two other women and wives he had. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times before his brother until he came near to him. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Today you have received the apology but also know that the call is to forgive even if you don't. Amen. <laughs> and Ashe. Ashe o. Ashe o. Ha. Well, as we say, we're going to open up the doors of the church right here. If you know you need to connect with a community that for the next couple of months is going to be wrestling with God and angels around forgiveness. If you know you harbor unforgiveness in your heart or you struggle with it as a principle or you don't and you just want to be a part of a radically loving institution called Rise Community Church and we invite you to join us. You can let us know in the chat. You can send an email. You can shout us out on Facebook. You can use the raise hand feature. But know that all are welcome in this space. I want to praise God for Aaron, Michelle Washington, and Daniel Omatoso Black. Y'all, can we praise God again? We praise God for you, Umi K. Praise God. Praise God for the word. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Ashe, Ashe. And y'all, none of us heard or knew what the other was going to write. Right. So we're hearing each other for the first time today. Y'all are amazing. 
God blessed with the vision through this connection we had this week, through some yard work that I did this week that I still need to post about. And out of it, Holy Spirit told me that the three of us needed to stand together. And so as we walk into forgiveness, know that the apology is there. Now the next question is, now what you gonna do? What are we going to do in response? Amen and amen.